over the last couple of years, the truth that comes out in all of the stuff that's hitting the TV screen these days is about our economy, about the market. The housing market seems to kind of be a, um, a uh, barometer, that's the word I'm trying to find, for what the economy is like. Or at least that's a, a bit of how I understand it, probably overly simplistic. But, you know, if the housing market is doing well, chances are the economy is doing well. If the housing market is completely tanked, it's probably not a good thing for the economy. That is Economics 101 from somebody who does not know, do economics classes very well. So, But in this story that we're going to read today, we talk about a bit of a, an economy, if you will. Back, back in a time that's different than ours, and we'll talk a little bit about, about that, but there's a person who gives all that they have for a field. Now, Scott, can I, if I can dare to put you on the spot, have you ever been with a, a client and say, you know, you're showing them a house and you say, this house costs everything you have? No. I didn't think you were going to say yes. I really would have been surprised if you had. <laughs> My guess is to, not knowing very much about selling houses, um, that if you had somebody you, you, know, you had to say, this house is worth, it's going to cost everything you have, they probably would turn around and run pretty quick. Okay. But in this story, the person doesn't run, but with joy, sells all they have for this field. Million dollar question, was it, worth a, was it a worthwhile purchase? Let's pray. Lord, your treasures blow us away. The thought of your kingdom can blow us away. And yet you use one to describe the other. And so we pray that these parables may speak to us, may remind us of just what it is that you offer for us. Amen. The story itself comes from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13, verses 44 to 50. Jesus says, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which someone found and hid. Then in his joy, there's our word, goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. And, put, and when it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good into baskets and threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come down and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, last week, we were talking about how Jesus broke down social barriers and health barriers to make sure that everybody could be a part of his ministry or affected by his ministry, included in it. This week, he breaks that pattern a little bit. Not in a a condescending way of looking down on lepers or the social outcast. They can still be uh, certainly receiving his ministry. But he realizes this is about halfway or so into the gospel. He realizes that hard-heartedness is starting to infect some of the people who are around him, who are listening to him. They may perhaps be the ones that we were talking about last week who were just followed Jesus around for a miracle. So that they can get the, uh, the, sh the show that's going on with this new guy, Jesus. And as he teaches in parables, in these stories, as some say, a, what do they call it, an earthly story with a heavenly theme to it. These are the people that just sort of blow them off. Maybe they think the show is over. And they go, Psh, whatever, guy, you've lost your mind and continue on in their spiritual darkness and blindness. But those who had ears to hear, as he puts it, they would be the ones who are 
wanting more and itching for more and wanting to eat up everything that Jesus is teaching them. To those, Jesus would give a little more insight here into the kingdom of heaven. And in this case, he's been talking in parables for uh, the better part of this chapter, so we're kind of dropping into the middle of his parables. But this is the part where he's talking to his disciples. He's got them kind of alone. Those who we know are not blowing him off, just wanting a show, as those with the spiritual hard-heartedness may be doing. So let's see what these parables have to teach us. Now, for the sake of organization, we're going to go in a little bit of a different order than how Matthew had, had put them out Talking about the net, and then the treasure, and then the merchant. Three, one, two, I think it is. But it'll all make sense. So the parable of the net. The big, passage, the big part of it. Jesus says again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. And when it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good into baskets, but threw out the bad. As I said, Jesus is speaking to his disciples in this particular segment of the, of the chapter. A number of which come from a fishing background. So as he did earlier in his mission, he's kind of starting to talk people's language again. Starts describing things in a way that they're going to, to understand. Now the thing to remember back then, is fishermen didn't use poles. They didn't catch fish one at a time. But they used these big nets. And in this case, what they would do is they'd have the net between two boats, drop part of it down, they'd hold on to part of it, and the weights would sink it down to the bottom. Or down a good amount, anyway. And then they would end up bringing the net together, bringing it up, and would catch many fish. If you've ever seen an episode of uh, Deadliest Catch, you'll kind of get more of the idea of this sort of fishing en masse, if you will led to indiscriminate fishing. Some fish would be good, worth keeping. Some fish would be bad and be just tossed back. Now if you have ever talked to Larry Miles about evangelism, you will hear an awful lot about nets, about the idea of casting the net for a catch. And when we, fit, when we fish for people, as we had talked about a few weeks ago, as Jesus calls his disciples to do, we catch all kinds of people. Some who may have ears to hear, want to learn more about this gospel story that we tell, and some who may have that hard-heartedness, blow us off, say, Psh, whatever, you've lost your mind. It happened to the disciple, it happened to Jesus, excuse me, happened to the disciples, and it happens to us. But the next verse tells the truth about who does the sorting. Verse 49, so it will be at the end of the age, the angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous. I'm going to read that again a little bit differently. So it will be at the end of the age, not us will come out and separate the evil from the righteous. Put another way, whose job is it to cast a net and fishing for men? as Jesus called his disciples to do? That part's our job. Whose job is it to sort the catch? Not our job. Next parable. The parable of the treasure. Now, I know it may seem strange to have three buried treasures here at the front of a sanctuary, but back 2,000 years ago, it was actually not that absurd of an idea to find buried treasure in a field somewhere. Remember, we're talking about a time that does not have banks out there. And when wartime comes, as it often did around this area, as people from the outside are trying to take over what we know as Israel, if you've got a number of valuables, and you don't have a bank as we know it, what do you do with them to keep them safe? But you bury them in the ground. That is how you would keep them safe. I know it's low tech and all, but this is 2,000 years ago. Oftentimes, landowners would bury their treasure without actually telling anybody where they were putting it. And the secret would end up dying with them. Families, servants may not know where this treasure is, but somebody comes along and, if they're working the field or whatnot, 
They work in a job that requires digging. They may come across buried treasure. But I wanted you to notice two words that come in the same idea when somebody finds this buried treasure out in the field. Joy and selling everything. If you think the idea of buried treasure is absurd, the idea of putting these two words or ideas together just plain old sounds insane. Just sell everything by itself can sound absolutely nuts. So I ask you, is there anything on earth that you would sell even half of, everything, <coughs> half of what you own to get it? Bev, can you think of anything? What's up? Okay. So the idea of selling everything you have, <coughs> not much the earth would offer if they for. they jewelry, they can uh, sell it. Yeah. We're not describing something you can find in the classifieds or find up on the stock exchange. The classifieds couldn't put enough zeros after that dollar sign to be able to describe this kingdom that Jesus is talking about. Where he can put joy and selling everything together, and all of a sudden it's not really that crazy. Now, am I suggesting that God calls everybody to sell everything they have for the kingdom? No. I had to think about that for a second just to make sure I asked the right question. Does he call some people to do that? Yes. I have had uh, friends in seminary that would move entirely across the country, oh, halfway across the country with nothing but what they could fit in their car and start over working for the kingdom. I knew one person who would give up not only everything that he had, but just about everything he knew between family and culture and language to be able to come here and serve for the kingdom. Called this way or not, we can know the investment would be absolutely worth it. Next parable. The parable of the merchant. The middle one in our passage for today. Now many interpret this one, looking at it on the surface, as Jesus is the pearl and people, we are the merchant, the one who really, really, really wants this pearl, and so we sell everything we have to be able to get it. Especially in light of that previous, previous parable about the worth of this one pearl. But I disagree with this. Here's why. If we interpret it that way, it smacks in the face of grace. To think that, like Simon the Magician in Acts 8, that we could purchase a gift that God offers, that Jesus offers. In fact, it denies the truth of that very gift that Luke talks about in Luke 12, 32. Do not be afraid, little, fo little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Instead, looking at this parable, I would see the church as the pearl, as the treasure and Jesus as the merchant. We may think it's insane to sell all that we have for one treasure, let alone one pearl, as Jesus is describing in this case. But that's exactly what this man from Galilee did. Giving all that he had, all that he could give for this one pearl. To buy that pearl, if you will. Giving his life, putting up with what he did, in the life while he was living. And so the million dollar question remains, was it a worthwhile purchase for this merchant to offer everything he could for this one pearl? Well, I think Paul answers that question for us, for the truth he gives to the church at Rome. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things. He offered everything. How will he not also give us all things?